Um, no, I think I'm good with just the tacos. I got those because if we fill them with veggies, we're good. Mm -hmm. And I look at the carb We'll wait to share that with us here in just a moment. Oh, sorry, hun, help me. I'm not on I'm on mute. Was that like his coach or something? Mm -hmm. Everybody should mute their speaker. Well, that's loud. to figure out on my phone. <laughs> Mr. Kitsis, how do we do backgrounds? I want to do something cool. So that's not a fake kitchen, Tracy? No, this is my real kitchen i figured it would be better here instead of my buffet that you know doubles as my um well you have to go into the share screen but but it's uh i think that's where it is but it's uh oh no 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 you go to the uh video uh -huh. and, and then see the little arrow and then it says choose virtual background oh no i hadn't done that before we got options well, it's, it's, yeah, you have options, then you could choose something from yours, too. One of your pictures. Where, wait, what options are there? Let me see, I can't, I did a long time ago, let's see. You have to, uh, you have to download something. Well, then we are going to Disneyland tonight, folks, just so we're clear. <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> Oh, Tracy? Yeah. So if you go to, it says choose virtual background. Yes. And the plus a plus sign. Yes. So that'll take you to your own hard drive to find something. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have 6.30 on the dot. Let's do a quick roll call. Tracy, I see you. Mr. Kitts, is Mr. Silva, are you there? Mr. Wyndham and Mrs. Daly. All right. Okay, so we'll let's uh, bring the meeting to order and uh, welcome to where am I? 21 participants so far. Um, look forward to a, a very positive meeting this evening. And we will start with a uh, moment of reflection, please.
All right, and thank you very much. And uh, next is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. There's a little flag for us. Uh, ready, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Get back to where I'm supposed to be. All right, excuse me for a sec. I can't seem to find the Oh, there it is. There we go. Stop the share. Very good. A little technical difficulties. Uh, item number nine, approval of the agenda. Dr. Shmia, any changes to the agenda as uh, presented this evening? No, sir. No changes. Fantastic. Um, can I get a motion and a second, please? For the approval of the agenda, anyone? I'll move it. Moved by uh, Ms. Daly, second by? Sean. Sean, very good. Uh, it's gonna be a roll call vote. Um, Shelly? I just lost you. Ah. I see you, are you there? No, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> but you can hear me, is that I a yes? I uh, yes, and I'll try to find a visual. Bye. Yeah, fantastic. Tracy? Yes. Uh, Michael? You're muted. Mr. Pitsis? You're muted. <laughs> try to be nice. Yes. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wyndham, Sean? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a yes as well. Item number 10, I'm going to report out on closed session items. During the closed session, the board discussed four student discipline cases, personnel issues, and the superintendent's report on goals for 2019-2020. Uh, the following action was taken during closed session. Uh, approved, by appoint, uh, approved the appointment of Greg White as assistant principal to Jepson Middle School by a unanimous roll call vote of six to zero. Trustee Malberg uh, was absent for the vote and she'll be absent this evening uh, as well. All right. Item number 11, student discipline recommendations. Uh, recommended action that the board approve the recommendations for the following student discipline cases. It's gonna be 07-1920-RA, 08-1920-RA, 09, and 010-1920-RA. Do I have a motion? I'll move it. Moved by Daly, second by Wyndham. Roll call vote. Uh, Mrs. Daly? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Michael? Yep. Sean? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a, a yes as well. All right, at this time, uh, we are going to go into item number 12, which is a uh, public hearing. And we're going to ask uh, Assistant Superintendent of Business and Administration Services, Kelly Burks, will present the proposed budget for Buckingham as soon as I bring it up and share with you. Good evening, President Jansen and board members and Superintendent Shamia. I'm going to start with Buckingham Charter School, who has a new name and a new location for next year, lots of changes. So it's Buckingham Collegiate Charter Academy now. So this is a summary of their revenues. Uh, so it's an estimation of how we think we're going to close and then as well as a look at what their budget looks like for next year. So local control funding formula obviously is the largest um, part of their budget and has the largest decrease because in this budget is based on the May revision from the governor which has that negative 7.92 proration factor. 
And then for um, state revenues, um, they just changed slightly and that's because of prior year lottery funds. And we always get prior year adjustments and we just remove those until we receive them in the next year. And then for the local revenue, uh, it changed just slightly just because of some donations from last year. There was some one-time donations. And then we also don't budget carryover until first interim. So that's not included um, in this presentation either. So we'll add that then. So overall revenue did decrease by $357,000. Go to the next slide there for expenditures. So um, this is a summary of the expenditures. Again, making that comparison between the two years. Uh, certificated salaries are projected to increase by about $100,000. And that's due to step and column movement, as well as an additional teacher. Um, they have an art teacher that's going to be joining them, which actually did increase their overall FTE. Classified salaries are projected to increase by that $939. That's step and column, but then we also lowered extra duty costs and substitute costs just based on their actuals from this year. And then benefits just reflect those changes above. Um, and it's just a combination of all of that. And then we also decreased the STRS rate and increased the PERS rate in the governor's proposal. He is pr proposing to buy down the STRS and PERS rates. So they're actually decreasing. So in 1920, the STRS rate was 17.1%, and now it's going to be 16.15. And then for PERS, it went up, but only by 1%, which was lower than what it was originally proposed in January. And then books and supplies are proposed to increase by $200,000, largely due to some one-time furniture costs because of the move and going to the new campus. And then we also applied to the consumer price index, but that was only a 0.62% increase. And then for services and other operating costs, uh, they're decreasing by about $46,000. And that's mostly because of the oversight and administrative fees, because those are based on those LCF revenues, which did decrease. And then capital outlay decreased by 118,000. Uh, that was a one-time expense for the robotics building for that new lease. It was going to be for some electrical upgrades, which they actually ended up not doing, but it was in budget. So we removed it actually from both years. So then looking ahead at the MYP, their multi-year projection, uh, we plan these based on lots of assumptions that we receive from the DART board that we get from School Services of California as well as the planning uh, of amounts that are in the governor's budget. That's what this is based on, which we hope will change when we actually see an adopted budget. Um, so the projected rates are subject to change, of course, depending on what is actually adopted on June 15th, and then what comes out in that trailer bill language, which will be very important this year. Um, so the revenues um, in the two out years assume LCFs, LCFF's proration factor, which is the first time that we've seen that with this formula and then all the other factors that are in the governor's May re revised budget. And then expenditures consider step and column movement, changes in staffing um, is for their salaries and benefits because uh, there's some movement. And then we've also included known increases to benefits such as PERS and STRS because the rates will go up in the two out years even though they will be lower for this year. And then also estimated costs for health and welfare costs that typically do increase as well. And then we also apply the consumer price index to those supplies and services. So if a budget is adopted uh, with the state and what they're proposing with the 2.31% COLA, and if we do get some federal money uh, from either the CARES Act via the ESSER funds or the GEARS fund, the budget will look better for them. As you can see in that third year out, they are showing their ending fund balance is negative by almost a million dollars. But if the governor, um, you know, if we don't have to take that cut that the governor proposed, um, then they'll actually end up with about another $2 million in revenue, which obviously then would eliminate that uh, negative amount in that third year. Um, so our fingers are crossed for that. Are there any questions? I have one question. Okay. So, so this, so the revenues here are based on the governor's original, um, revised with the 8%, 7.92% each year cut? Yes. Okay. Yes, so the anything that may come through in the adoption that is different, uh, we most likely will have to bring a 45 day revised budget. And can I, Kelly, so, yeah. and what we're looking at now is that we don't think it's going to be a negative 7.92 COLA. 
So the revenue, it, it will be a better looking budget because that's all indications are, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it, we either get the 2.29 or a zero COLA. So the budget looks a little scary there, but we can't assume any revenue until the governor passes a budget. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And it is a difference of $2 million just for Buckingham if that does happen. And we're required, um, you know, by law to have the budget adopted in June. So we have to do it with as far as we know, but it's likely that you'll bring back a revision. Right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> two million at zero, Cola? Sorry, Shelly, I just saw your hand. Um, no, the two million is third year out. Yeah, yeah, the two million is over the three years and assumes the 2.31% COLA increase as well for next year. I have a question. I know that they were renting that gym, which was quite a bit of money, and obviously we won't have that expense. Was that in the operating costs eliminated over time, or where was that? Yeah, that's eliminated. So because they're moving, uh, when we built their budget for Buckingham, we assumed the utilities that were the country high building in their budget. So they're actually not going to be paying for the gym or the other school or storage space for next year. That cost will be in Kimmy's budget because they'll be the ones utilizing that. Thank you. Yeah. And actually leases are paid for directly by the district. And the way that the charters end up paying for that is via that administrative charge and those facility charges. So we, we charge 1% for oversight, 2% for facilities, and then 15% for other general admin. And there's a lot of things that make up that. So that's how they pay for those leases. All right, board members, any other questions? Okay, with that, um, for the rest of the attendees, I have opened up the chat. Uh, so if you would like, uh, I'm gonna open this up to public comment here shortly, as well as the next three items, which would be the Fairmont Charter Elementary Budget and a resolution on the Education Protection Account, and also the comments from the floor. And those are gonna be items not on the agenda uh, if you would like to speak. Uh, so I'll give you the opportunity during this time to put your name in the chat and what you would like to speak on so I can make sure I get you in the appropriate box and we'll go from there. Uh, so it is open and with that we'll uh, open up the public hearing for item 12A for the Buckingham Collegiate Charter Academy budget adoption. Okay, and seeing none, we'll uh, close the public hearing and move on to item 12B. And guess what? It's you, Miss Kelly. Oh wait, I, I gotta get my, uh, <laughs> I gotta get my screen up, I'm sorry. It's okay. So while you're getting that pulled up, um, I'll just talk about some changes with Fairmont. So, you know, they're not without change either. Um, they're not physically moving, but we are moving their actual funds. Uh, so they were in a fund, uh, fund 08 in 18, or in 1920. And now we're going to be moving all of their budgets to fund 05 in 2021. And that's due to a new statement from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, statement number 84. And so we're actually going to be moving our associated student body funds into Fund 08 for 2021, and then Fairmont will reside in Fund 05. Um, so that is a change with their budgets as well. Okay, so with revenues. So this is a summary of their revenues comparing the two years again. Um, the LCFF is also has that deficit factor from the May revision. Um, enrollment for 1920 for um, Second interim was 611, but for 2021, we're increasing it to 631. And that's based on projected enrollment as of May, May 26th, where they actually have 640 kids enrolled. So to be conservative, we budgeted at 631. So it's an increase of about 20 students. And then we're using the historical average of 94.4 for their attendance rate. Federal revenues did decrease by 45,000. 
we really have no idea what we're going to receive for Title I funds, so we just went with an overall 20% reduction. Normally, we get those allocations in April, but the state still has not posted anything for any of our Title funds, so we're just doing a best guess, hearing that a decrease might be coming because they might be taking those Title I funds and repurposing them for the COVID-19 efforts. We just don't know how much it's going to be. And then for the state revenue, they're also projected to de decrease by 14,000. And that's again, that removal of the prior year adjustments for um, both the restricted and unrestricted lotteries. And then for the local revenue, we're projecting a decrease of about $5,000. And that was due to a one-time VPEF grant that they received in 1920. And then for the expenditures, it's a summary and a comparison again. Certificated salaries are projected to decrease by about $90,000. And that's due to just some staffing changes and movements. And they're also not filling a 0.7 FTE position due to attrition. So their overall FTE actually did decrease. Then classified salaries, they're projected to increase by about $10,000 due to step and column. And then they also did add some additional sub and extra duty time, um, just based on historical averages. And then for the benefits, they're de decreasing by about $100,000. And that's due to those staffing changes that were mentioned above. And then again, those differences in the PERS and STRS rates. So then for books and supplies, they're projected to de decrease by about $100,000. And that's because we don't budget carryover at budget adoption. And then they also had a few one-time expenditures. Um, they installed some security cameras on the outside of the buildings and then a server to also do that as well. And then they also purchased some laptops with their COVID-19 funding uh, that they received from the state this year. And that was to help them with their distance learning efforts. Um, and then we also uh, applied the consumer price index rate. And then for the services and other operating, we're projected to decrease by about $60,000. And that's due to the overall fees for the oversight that again are tied to those LCFF revenues. And then for capital outlay, again, that $40,000 was for the security camera project that they did. So the overall expenditures decreased by about $392,000. And then looking at their multi-year projections, their budget actually looks really good. They have really healthy reserves. And um, they're based on those same assumptions that we just spoke about with um, Buckingham. And then in the out years, they also assume those same projections for LCFF. Expenditures consider step and column movement, and as well as those changes to those PERS and STRS rates. Um, they do have that very healthy reserve, as you can see here. So this is technically like a worst case scenario and they still look fine. Um, so Fairmont is in really good shape. Um, if they do end up getting the fully funded COLA amount uh, for the 2.31% for next year and also possibly receive some federal money, their revenues over the next three years would be increased by about $2 million as well. Are there any questions? Can I, oh, sorry, I'll wait for questions. I was gonna make a comment. I'll wait. So quick, yeah, just quickie. So if, did I hear, when will we know if it's even a possibility that the Title I funds were to get pulled? Because it makes my head spin. And I bring it up now just because I had mentioned like board advocacy. This feels like a time where, or is this one of those things where we're gonna be held to the deliverables of, of the Title I needs of our app promise, you know, look, so, right, our disadvantaged kids, but then they take the money? Or is Title I gone and we're still keeping the money? I just wanna make sure, it just seems like a crappy precipice to be on. Yeah, it is really difficult, especially when you're trying to project budget. Um, but I don't think that they'll pull the funds entirely. I think we will just see a reduction. It just remains to see how much of a reduction it will end up being. And why I think they're not ready to make a decision is because I think the state is still waiting to see what the federal government's going to do. And I think once they know that, then they'll make a decision. So I think that's what it's, what it's hinging on. Does Title I, though, still have requirements on us? Yes. They have not lifted any of those requirements or made any of those things flexible. Okay. So there you go. So uh, maybe we can please keep us posted and put that advocacy on our agenda someday in the near future. John. Hey. I, I have a question. Yes. So looking at the Buckingham and looking at the Fairmont, I mean, why are why is there such a gaping chasm between revenues and expenses at Buckingham and no chasm at Fair, Fairmont? Um, regarding their current year revenues, or are you talking about well, their all, all, all three years? 
Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the main thing for Fairmont is they have those really healthy reserves. They're in a much better um, reserve situation than Buckingham is, um, starting at almost 30% reserves. Um, so that's huge. Um, you know, when we talk about cash really being so important, it really is, especially in these times of downturn. And so that's why I think overall they look so much better, even in their worst case scenario. Right, but <clears throat> like if you look at Fairmont, their revenues and, and expenditures are very close to each other. If you look at Buckingham, there's like a $900,000 difference between the revenues and expenditures. So that's, that really strikes me anyway when I see it. I can, yeah, um, Fairmont has about 100 more kids um, also, so that there's a big difference in their enrollment as well. Um, so that, that makes a big difference also, um, that per kid uh, amount is vastly different by almost 100, actually a little over 100. And Fairmont has grown in their enrollment over the past um, two, three years. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge Mr. Moffitt, the principal. Hello, Greg. He's been, you know, he had an incredible first year. And um, they had declining enrollment for a while. And then about two years ago, it started to increase. And they had some budget issues. They were looking at some reductions, I'd say two, three years ago. There were moments, it was around, I think, I think a couple of years ago, it was around 560. I think it's at 600 now. So I think part of the issue is that their enrollment has grown, they get more revenue. So when the cost of things go up, they're able to handle it better. And Buckingham has a pretty stable enrollment. They haven't declined, they've just kind of been around 500 the past few years, right? Yeah. In 1920, they were at 495, and then for 2021, they're at 500. Yeah. And it most likely will come in higher. Um, Allie also likes to budget very conservatively. So, you know, we, we, when their enrollment was declining, they did some reductions, and then their enrollment went up, so their budget looked a lot better as, as it is now. Yeah. Okay, any other questions from the board? Fantastic hearing none, and I have uh, no one on chat, but I will open up uh, the public hearing. Consider it open if anybody would like to speak from the public in regards to the budget for Fairmont. And not seeing any, we're gonna go ahead and close that public uh, hearing, and we will move on once again to Ms. Kelly for item 12C. The Education Protection Act, right? Yes. Oh, <laughs> okay. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I don't have the agenda in front of me. <laughs> I was looking to see if I had another uh, PowerPoint I had to try to bring up, but no. So this is going to be the re resolution regarding the Education Protection Account. Yes. So the Education Protection Account was created mm -hmm. uh, via Prop 30 back in 2012, which is a temporary increase to the state's sales tax for all taxpayers, as well as the personal income tax rates for the upper uh, income taxpayers, that top 1% in California. And the revenues that were generated from Prop 30 are deposited into an account at the state called the Education Protection Account. And it's a separate account that the state cannot use for any other purpose if it has to go straight to education. Then uh, Prop 55 authorized an extension of the temporary income tax just on those uh, top wage earners, not the addition or the continuation of the increased sales tax. And that uh, will go through 2030. So this year, it's been determined, it's been determined that the EPA has been significantly overappropriated, uh, which is not unexpected given the impact of COVID-19 and the crisis that that's had on the state revenues, and the fact that we still don't technically know uh, what our uh, uh, taxes will be because that date changed to July 15th, when normally we would know by April 15th. So we might have already received all the funds that we actually will receive for this account with our first three quarter payments, which is around $14 million. I know on the report it says that we're supposed to receive by about 18 million, um, but we probably won't get that fourth quarter. And it's not technically a loss in revenue. The state actually does have to make that up with, by, by providing additional state aid because it is one of the three parts that makes up the overall LCFF calculation. And the way that the funds have to be spent, there are some requirements for that. We have to have a public hearing, which we're having today. And then we also can't spend them on administration costs. 
And then every year we have to, once we close our books, we have to put on our website how the funds were spent. So what we did for 1920 was we decided to pay for 184 teachers' salaries and benefits with the EPA funds. And I propose we do the same for next year. Okay, Any fantastic. Questions? Anybody? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and open this up to public uh, comment as well. And I don't have anybody on chat, but we'll give it just a few seconds. And Kelly, when we were talking, that's the, the sole source that you're allowed to use these funds for, correct? It's just for um, salaries and benefits of teachers, not, not services, supplies, anything like that. Correct. Okay. Good. And with seeing no one else uh, wanting to speak on it, we'll close the public comment on item 12C. Kelly, thank you for those three items. Appreciate it. Thank you. And items 13, it's comments from the floor. This is uh, limited to three minutes per individual, 21 minutes per topic. And this is for items that are not currently on the budget. Um, the chat is still open if you would like. I do have one person that would like to speak, it looks like on the opening of school in the fall semester. So um, from 719405, if you would kindly introduce yourself to the to the board and you have a total of three minutes once you start. Can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? There. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, my name is Alicia Walker and I just wanted to address, I, I know it wasn't on the agenda to speak about this, so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, <laughs> I just want to strongly um, discourage the district from implementing the state guidance related to schools, specifically the wearing of masks by students, teachers, administrators, forced six feet separation, and the not sharing of instructional materials, games, sports, and rallies. Um, I feel like the masks are super restrictive, how teachers are really going to express, you know, uh, the, the curriculum, how are they going to understand? I know when I wear the masks in certain places in town that we're forced to, I can barely hear the person talking. Um, I have two teenagers in high school at Baca High, and their mental state um, from social distancing from their friends um, has been astronomical. Um, they've become depressed, they become withdrawn, um, and I'm really concerned about their mental state as well as their friends. And um, I just really just discourage this from happening. Um, it's really emotional for me as a mom and as a parent. Um, I know that we're in a pandemic. I'm not disregarding other people's lives and well-being, but schools <coughs> can't operate this way, in my opinion. It just doesn't seem like a healthy environment for our children. So. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you. What was your name again? Alicia Walker. Alicia, thank you very much for your comments tonight. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right, and I'll leave the chat open just for another second to see if anybody else would like to speak. Again, these are on items not on the agenda. Okay, and seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, close that segment, uh, number 13, and we'll move on to number 14. Uh, Superintendent's comments and correspondence, Dr. Shamia. Thank you, President Jansen. Um, you are welcome. I have three things. The first thing, um, real quick, I want to talk about is the June 20th workshop format. I sent you all a communication. I wanted to go over it quickly, see if you have any questions, and um, we can, it's our proposed format. We can continue to talk about it. So, last time we talked about a, a Zoom versus in person which I prefer. Um, we talked about the Wilseywood Theater because we can distance more. That's not possible because they're gonna be doing some construction there. But um, what I'm proposing is that we have it here in our boardroom and we can include a Zoom component and we can also social distance. And the six board members, because I'm assuming pretty much sure Shelly uh, can participate by, participate by Zoom. So the rest of the six board members will fit, well, you can sit and spread out on the dais um, 
Teresa and I could sit on the floor at the table. We'll spread the chairs out, out spread the chairs out. Um, the public can participate by Zoom. We'll have Zoom on the screen. We don't have a camera for Zoom, but we will also have our online. So a lot of people, I don't know if they were aware that all of our board meetings in the past were always online. So we'll have two actual ways for people to watch the board meeting. One, they can watch virtually online and see and hear, or two, they can participate on Zoom. And, and we'll have Shelly on Zoom and we'll have people from the public. And if they wanna speak, they'll be able to speak uh, during public comment. Um, and then we'll have people working and ensuring that it, it, we don't exceed limit and ensure that if people come in and can't fit in the room and wanna speak, we can monitor that. So that's um, pretty much the plan. I went over it with technology. They are actually going to test everything out to make sure that if they have a Zoom and that's projected on the screen to make sure that participants can hear and be heard when they speak. Any question? And, and that's just a proposal now. We can continue to look at it. But um, are there any questions from board members or something? You want me to look further on that? I think it's great. I, I was just at the Board of Supervisor meeting this, on last Tuesday, and they have a much smaller dais than we do. And they have six people that sit there. And they were not, even at the Board of Supervisors, they weren't six feet apart. Three of them had masks on, two didn't. So I think that, that we're being very cautious and very prudent, so. Okay. So, you know, if anybody has any concerns, obviously board members uh, reach out to me, we can talk more, but I would like to plan it this way. And um, JJ and I will continue to, to work together and um, it'd be so nice to see you all in person. <laughs> Okay, my second item is around, speaking of in-person, is around in-person graduation ceremonies. I've sent you different information over time. I wanted to kind of pull it all together and talk about this because we have had requests around in-person graduations. Um, we want to have a graduation. We meaning, I think, board members, myself, administration, principals, our job is um, sometimes extremely challenging. So we actually look forward to the celebrations. And um, the parent that talked about uh, students feeling depressed, adults um, feel a little depressed, I think. And, and for the administration and leaders in this district, we absolutely love the celebrations. So I wish that we could have in-person graduations sooner rather than later. But we did have, as part of the original plan, there were some July dates chosen and we're going to start working on those July dates. I just wanted to go over some of the advice and directives I've received as I started to unravel whether or not we could have in-person graduations. And the latest, uh, which I believe I shared with you board members, was the California Department of Public Health. Their directive was shared with um, our county public health that said, all gatherings should be postponed or canceled. This includes gatherings such as concerts, conferences, school sporting events, and that a gathering is any event or convening that brings together people in a single room or single space all at the same time, such as auditorium, stadium, arena, large conference room, meeting hall, cafeteria, indoor or outdoor. So, um, and they go on to say this applies to non-essential. So that's the first directive or guidance that, that we have basically from the state public health. I also reach out to our attorney and I also reach out to our insurance company. Our attorney works for a fairly large uh, law firm, Lozano Smith, that represent like 400 school districts and um, they will be coming to our workshop on the 20th. So they, they have a team at their law firm that has been researching board authority around um, opening, closing, et cetera. So I, and, and you know our attorney, he's, he's come before you with advice before, so I do trust his advice. And he did actually pretty extensive research around, first of all, what's an essential function? And um, what, what does not just the governor's executive order, but also the Solano County Shelter at Home order? What, 
what do they what do they mandate so the first thing he said is that school when you look at the order such as the county order schools are essential functions but ceremonies are not essential function education is an essential function whether it's distance learning or whatnot but a ceremony is not an essential function and it's the same as sports we canceled sports he even went so far as to to research um case law and our board policy around graduation ceremonies and activities and and rights versus privilege there so um, his advice basically was you would be violating a state order you would be violating executive order and he he looked at the the county order said you would be violating that so his legal advice is we should not do it and then our insurance company pretty much reiterated the same and when it comes to insurance um i don't like to not do what our lawyer says but i also don't like to follow what our insurance is saying because they're essentially saying um, uh, this event is 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 not sanctioned by us, not not protected by insurance, and um, waiver is doesn't resolve that basically in so many words. So I just wanted to make sure there was an understanding and that none of you had any questions around that because I know there's a lot of back and forth on whether we can do this or not. But I I would like to do it, but I I have to um, I feel like follow the advice of our attorney at, and as well as our, our insurance carriers. Do you have a question, Sean? Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, just a couple. <laughs> When you spoke with the attorney, was that because didn't Solano County just um, loosen some restrictions a little bit? I believe gyms are going to be opening up and things of that nature. So hasn't that changed since we last consulted with the attorney? He said, yeah, and it was, he said, I'm just reading his note. It has, but, but what the, um, what the California Department of Public Health said is it's not until stage four. So essentially the county and the state that are in conflict. They, they actually, I don't know if they're in conflict. Hang on, he highlighted in the order, here it is, high risk, medium risk yeah his the way i understood it that he said to me was that it's not permissible until phase four if the board wants i can go back i have no problem going back and, and asking him if we could put it up i can clarify that we we have him on saturday though right i'm sorry sean not to cut you off Right, we have access to them on Saturday. Who's yeah. with him? Are you talking about the attorney or Bela? I have the same both. question, John. Both. Both on Saturday. So that I I would not spend any extra time doing that. We could clarify that on Saturday when we we have the whole pop. That'd be my suggestion only. Sorry, Sean, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, that's okay. And 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 I agree that you know at this point now I think I think it's prudent to wait till the twentieth. But it just seems counterintuitive to me that you know six feet apart indoors versus outdoors makes no sense it's it's it just doesn't I, I don't understand how those two things can be can exist in the same <laughs> recommendation or order whatever you want to call it so i'm just curious to hear how that justification um holds especially given that my understanding from the healthcare professionals was that heat is uh, uh, definitely something that reduces risk uh, of the virus so but i guess we'll just wait until the 20th thank you so I just found it was um, the first week of June. So yeah, it was, and I think it was right after we got into stage three. And I mean, the reason that I had to go through the attorney, go through insurance, I'm grabbing at all this different information because it feels like much like the CDE guidance that we don't, we, it, it kind of, the guidance changes and we don't get very clear all the time on guidance. He, he spent some time researching this. 
And I just ask because, I mean, obviously there's a lot of parent concern around it. I just think it's really important for, for everybody to understand that there is a lot of questions being asked, not just, you know, in, in, in the public eye, but also behind the scenes, because I can see where as a parent, it would really feel like I, it doesn't make sense. And, and the answers really aren't there. And I understand that it's difficult because you're in that spot of having kind of your kind of at the at the mercy of the healthcare professionals and, and trying to interpret that and figure that out. But I just think it's really important for people to understand why or why not, you know, and I know that you're trying to do that. And I appreciate that. So um, thank you for clarifying it. Hopefully on the 20th, we can get some more expert clarification. Yeah. And, and we will. And if we're in a different place, because because initially um, our director of communication, Elaine and I re were getting um, excited at the thought of moving it up. <coughs> but I do have to, frankly, not just the attorney, but the insurance piece makes me nervous because I'm nervous of course, about possible risk to people, but if they don't support an activity, anything that happens in that activity, not necessarily COVID, um, they are not gonna cover, just, just to be perfectly, you know, kind of blunt about it. So we are working on the save the date and yeah, a week from Saturday, uh, you will have Mr. Freeman and if things are, are changed or if he, if, if he reviews Again, he said he was going to work on opinion, and I asked him to put some time into that. So he, he's still working on that. So we should have that. Thanks, Sean. Any other questions about that? Tracy, you have a question? So I, I'm trying to think how to ask this distinctly. So does our insurance company have the right to enforce an executive order? I feel like how can they deny its insurability? Because my biggest concern is, can we invite them to our meeting on the 20th? Because if what were to happen if the attorney and our insurance company were at odds, and if the insurance company says, sorry, if we don't agree with your plan to reopen, we're not gonna insure you at school. Because mm -hmm. I feel like we're putting a lot of weight in this insurance and company's uh, opinion at this point. Um, and the the CDE isn't even enforcing the governor's order; they're giving guidance. So, so I know it's super stressful with the gray area. But the other thing that I wanted to throw out there was, did plans actually go to Bela? Because I mean, I literally just talked to him again today, and he said that he absolutely was okay with the that. There's a difference between social distance and physical distance, and we were talking specifically about a physical distance graduation plan, right? And that he was absolutely on board with that. So did he actually get the plan or did that die on the vine because we heard back from the attorney and in insurance? He, he saw our proposed plan and he said, if you can, as long as you can do six feet of distance. Okay. And I also, um, and, and that was our initial worry. But after that, I was kind of, um, I was excited. And then I did send it to, to the lawyer. And then of course, <coughs> you have to check with them it, in light of also the fact that nobody's nobody has done at that time there has been no in-person graduations and the other issue that came up was we're not doing we're not doing a lot of sports we're not doing any outdoor events or activities so i would just challenge because i i this i on i'm on my island and it's not personal it's just <laughs> philosophy that I am really concerned now that the insurance is going to have us over a barrel. So it, it's, well, let me finish because I just want to get it out so that I'm very concerned that they can trump our public health officer who was supposed to be the final say in boundaries and what we can and cannot do for safety. And so if we had blessing and the insurance company still said no go, I just need to understand clearly how much control they have over what decisions we make. And I, I just am less concerned about what everybody else is doing. And so that goes with the attorney too, to maybe ask that question ahead of time is, how can the attorney be contrary to who the state has given authority to direct us what state? It's just really important to me to understand that distinction. So the insurance company would not have an issue with whatever our reopening plans are because education is an essential function. 
And I think that was part of the crux of the argument is what are what is an essential function? So Dr. Mateus was saying um, education in general is an essential function. And that's why our attorney dug deep and looked at case law and looked at our board policy and said, well, education is an essential function, but a ceremony is not. So I don't, I, I don't, I can bring our attorney in. Um, the, the Hear you. I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, no, I got it, Tracy. I, I, I totally get <laughs> I'm frustrated in general. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I am very glad we're going to have Dr. Machas and the attorney at the uh, special board meeting. Um, I also know Dr. Machas and I talked to him after that happened, you know, after the, the questions came up. And he was very clear to me, and maybe he says different things to, other pe to different people, but he was very clear to me that all he could say is if you can keep six feet of distance from the time the people come on your property to the time they leave and all the time in there if you if you feel like you can implement that then you can do it right personally i don't think there's any way that we can implement that with 800 or a thousand people i mean that to me is an accident waiting to happen that's my opinion i hear other people have different opinions but he didn't say you could do it. And he said to me very clearly, he said, I'm not saying you could do it. I'm saying you could do it if from the moment they get on your property to the moment they get off, you have six feet of distance. So, and, and you know, you, I mean, we can decide if we can do that or not, but that's a pretty heavy implementation issue for 800 people. Yeah. Um. And we can, I can let Harold know that on the 20th, he can um, touch on that as well. And if we can move it up, great. Uh, right now we have the July dates and um, our director of communication, Elaine Kong was, was working on a communication there and save the dates and plans for Vaca High, Buckingham, Country High and Wilsey Wood. So I wasn't advocating that we move the dates up. I was more concerned about the the insurance understanding all the moving parts and what my understanding was not that we changed the date yeah. you know if we already have july dates and we're going to not talk about it till june 20th mm -hmm. right so yeah and just for clarification we don't run everything we do by insurance this is a you know because there's an executive order and there's a lot of confusion around this we did run it by them okay nothing more on that so I want to say one, one thing. I just want to acknowledge Elaine Kong, our communications director. She did a really great job on the virtual graduations. I had a lot of positive feedback and a lot of gratitude around um, the, the job well done and how beautiful they were. And they were a tremendous amount of time and work for her to put them all together, not just taping people, put them together and work back and forth with the high schools on the individual names. So I really wanted to acknowledge her work there. It was beautiful. And lastly, um, I sent a communication out today regarding the recent uh, racial comments that were made by some of our students on video. And I sent a communication a week ago and I sent a second one today that I would like to read, just read aloud. Um, and then I'm gonna actually have Sasha share. We've already had a lot of response to this and I'll have Sasha share some of that. Hello, Vacaville community. I hope this letter finds you well and healthy. Last week, I sent a letter to VUSD families in response to the racist comments on social media from some of our students. I've received several different reactions to my letter, both positive and negative. I apologize to anyone who found my words offensive or, dis or disappointing in any way. I am also truly sorry and embarrassed that BUSD students used hurtful racist slurs on social media. It's time to move forward as a school district. The Vacaville Unified School District is ready to step up and be part of the solution for this community. We must be bold and unafraid to say that we have a problem. It is not enough to not be racist, we must also be anti-racist. 
In VUSD, we are committed to being proactive and leading this conversation. To start this hard yet critical work, I created a task force and we wanna invite students, parents, members of the community and community groups to be part of that work. This is our city, our community, our children. We want the community involved and we want your ideas. We need to listen to the diverse voices in our community and build on the collective experiences that allow for true representation. Information is key to our culturally responsive approach. We understand that we must take the time to truly listen. If our families and students are hurting, we must open ourselves to hear their pain. All of our students deserve to feel welcomed and included and that they truly belong in our schools and community. Sorry, I have to sit some water. <clears throat> Any attitude or approach different from that is unacceptable. We recognize the immense responsibility <clears throat> that you entrust in us as an educational entity. And so it is imperative that we embark in this process it's going to take time, hard work, commitment, open hearts, ears, and minds. And then the last um, <clears throat> paragraph refers to contact information for Sasha Bigel, Assistant Superintendent of Educational Options, and Romero Barone, our Director of Student Attendance and Welfare. They are, they are leading this committee, this task force, um, they're gonna start with listening and working with our community, parents and students. And I'd like Sasha to share a little bit, if you would. Thank you, Jane. Um, yes, Ramiro and I have been absolutely overwhelmed um, with the responses we've already started to receive just today. So I think Jane sent that out um, around noon today and we have been hearing from community members, staff members, um, both teachers, administrators, parents, alumni. Uh, we've really been, I'm so proud of our community for just this, taking this one step, just outreach to us saying that they want to be part of the solution. Um, the emails have ranged from, you know, I, I just simply saying I want to be a part of this you know, connect me, let me know what I need to do next to people providing information, resources, links, ideas, suggestions. Um, so I, again, I'm so proud of our community. And as Jane said, we are going to start with listening. Um, even just today, as we're having conversations about how will this task force look, what, you know, how are, how, what will the structure be like? Um, we're already amending sort of our original plan because of all of the outreach and the people that want to be involved and want to offer their voice. Um, so we're going to kind of go, go slow to go fast um, initially and ensure that we are listening and providing opportunities to listen. I think that is the most important first step. Um, we need to hear the stories of our community, the ideas of our community, um, and, and go from there and let that guide us. Um, so I am so honored. Thank you, Jane, for um, trusting me to lead this process with Ramiro. And I, again, am so proud of our, our staff, our students, our community who've already started reaching out and want to engage in this critical work. Um, I do believe that the time is now, the moment is here, and um, I'm just really looking forward to the the tough conversations that we're going to have and the growth that we um, are going to gain from from this work. So thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And that's all I have, Mr. Jansen. Well, thank you, Dr. Shmi, and thank you for uh, taking the lead and putting that uh, committee together or task force, whatever we're going to end up calling it. I think uh, as healthy as an organization that we have, uh, even the healthiest organizations can take a look and see how we can do better. And uh, that's what makes us healthy is not afraid to uh, take uh, uncomfortable topics on and to continuously try to improve ourselves. So thank you again for taking that lead. With that item number 15, uh, board member comments. Um, the, the chat is off, but if you would like to speak, uh, someone may begin and then we can go from there. As soon as I say seeing none, Mike, Mike usually says something. So 
Okay. What's up, Sarah? Are you, are you, so you're ready? Yes, sir. Okay, all yours. Uh, so thank you, Superintendent Jane uh, and your whole team and the leadership throughout these two historical ongoing events with COVID-19 and how we reopen schools safely while responding to these local matters related to the ongoing Black Lives Movement matter. I'm very proud of our district's openness, self-reflection, and willingness to make a call to action for our community to come together and collaborate on how we can work together towards creating a safer, more inclusive learning environment for each of our students. This way, <clears throat> this way each of our students can focus on what we all consider to be the best, most robust quality education uh, institution that exists in this region here at Vacaville Unified School District. I would also like to thank the tremendous amount of parents, past students, current students, community members, and community agencies who have reached out to different members of the school board and district personnel over the past couple weeks uh, to share their personal experiences that have shaped their journey throughout their lives. Uh, many of your stories were very heartbreaking to hear, uh, such as the second grader who came home to his parents asking if he could change the color of his skin so that other kids would stop making fun of him. We're very humbled you feel comfortable reaching out to us, yet very saddened that you and your children have had these negative experiences in our school and in our community. I wanna say that we are all benefactors of those who came before us. And just as, those who have, just as we have benefited from the sacrifices of those before us, we have also inherited injustices that have passed on from generation to generation. Race cannot be something that continues to divide us as a nation or as a community. Again, race cannot continue to be something that divides us as a nation or within our own community. As we see the civil unrest throughout our nation, much of this goes far beyond the label of police brutality and crime. These are symptoms, not the root cause or root causes of how and why we perceive and treat people who look and believe and were born different than others. Many have attributed this unrest to the wealth gap, but we cannot talk about the wealth gap unless we're talking about the achievement gap. And we cannot address the achievement gap unless we're talking about race. But again, we can no longer allow race to divide our nation or this community. I'm inspired by our district's response and our community's response to collaborate as we seek to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren. As we continue this process, I would like to express my strong support for one, a third party with proven experience bridging divides that have had a focused experience on race and reconciliation. I would like for this to be rolled out continuously with various cohorts that will be able to lead the change that our children deserve. Number two, I support sharing a timeline to address these meetings and continuous opportunities for a diverse community group to get involved <coughs> and for our district to report back through social media and other website forms, uh, including possibly board meetings. Number three, I would like to thank the Vaca High's equity team for taking the initiative themselves to address a the concern they shared with their students. And I strongly support our district's direct su support to their needs. Number four, in the fall, the Solano County School Board Association is gonna begin a three-part series where there will be a facilitated discussion uh, along with some action items to examine how local policies influence student achievement. I'll be sharing more details with that um, as we come out in the next month or so. Uh, this will be designed to uh, invite local, locally elected officials from our cities, counties, and of course, our school boards, uh, as well as other community partners. Um, and in general, I, I ask that everyone in our community that is feeling and experience ongoing pain, um, that you are strong, you are loving, and you are capable. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else? Board members? Mr. Kitsis, your hand. Thank you, John. Yep. So for me personally, these last two weeks have been incredibly challenging and painful. Uh, I am so proud to see the district has stepped up to be a leader in the fight against racism. And Jane, I, I think your letter was great. I think it was right on. And my hope is that we leave no stone unturned because, you know, the last couple of weeks, I think, has taught me particularly that there's a lot out there that we need to look at. And I think 
this is a moment where everybody's kind of ready to do it. So I'm very excited. And uh, I really, I really am thankful for the development of the task force and uh, Sasha and uh, uh, Ramiro taking the lead on that. And I'm very, very uh, hopeful to see what comes from that. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? Fantastic hearing Charlie. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see her. So, <laughs> Miss Miss Shelley. I just want to. Um, there you go. Say thank, thank you again to Jane for writing what what I I believe the the board feels, which is it is our job to address these issues, and you have a plan for doing it. And thank you, Sasha and Ramiro, for for leading it. It's going to be a very um, long process and you're biting off something that's huge and emotional and uh worthwhile so thank you all for doing that and thanks again jane for your letter your transparency with the district the first letter explaining what happened with the girls and um we couldn't tell all the consequences because we can't by code do that but we want to assure parents things were done and um and to thank you again so that's all perfect thank you shelly Hi, John. Long, very comfortable pause. Mr. Wyndham, all yours. <laughs> um, I, I just, I also want to thank you, Jane, because I know this has been difficult and to say the least. Um, and, you know, this is a time when you're just not going to make anybody happy. And not, not, you're just not going to make everybody happy. I'm going to rephrase that. Um, there's, there's an awful lot of opinions out there and some very wide uh, chasms that have formed um, between people and, and things that have come to the surface. Uh, and I think you've done a really good job of, of managing that and, um, and really being uh, very communicative with the public. So I, I, I just want to thank you for that. And probably could be very popular for saying this, but that's okay. I always I, I kind of say things that I think need to be said. And I want to say that I hope that we all remember the focus here as an educational institution, that we need to focus on the climate and our campuses. Um, because I think a lot of what's being talked about on kind of the national stage has a lot to do with um, parents and, and uh, home life and things like that. So, you know, while, it's, while we have a responsibility to maintain safe and secure and, and, and positive environments on campus, uh, we also have to remember that um, there's a lot of external factors and so we need to really focus on you know the educational piece because i don't want that to get lost in i mean there's a, there's a global stage and there's global things that probably need to, to be addressed and and focused on um but i think i think we need to make sure that you know that we're focusing on that and being very sensitive to that there's there's a lot of different opinions out there racism and bias comes in all forms and all from all cultures and and so we really need to be prepared to deal with that and uh but I really want to thank you for, for the way that you've addressed it because um, this is this is not easy and no matter what we do, we're going to get people that disagree and that's okay, but you've done a great job, so thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. Anyone else? Can you see me? Okay, so I also want to just say thank you. I heard it. Uh, Maya Angelou said that prejudice is a burden that confuses the past, threatens the future and renders the present inaccessible. And that hit me really hard in the last week. And so I think what I'm most thankful for is Jane's discretion and thoughtfulness to really recognize that we're all coming from a different lens and experience. And I think that's what makes our district special is that we all believe that education is the great equalizer and the gift that we can give to our kids is a new lens to look through, to, to talk about social justice, to talk about racism, to talk about um, opportunity and hope and prejudice and bias and and just be bold and brave and have conversations that maybe they're not exposed to elsewhere in a safe environment and so i think that sasha and romero are fantastic ambassadors for this project besides the fact of who you are but also the fact that you know our mtss model is the perfect place to embed culture change right from the beginning of our kids and from kindergarten on um and giving a next generation a different kind of opportunity and experience. So I also just sat on this, um, the SPAV, the Solano Partnership Against Violence, 
And there is very disturbing data that besides all of the deficit that is facing, and, and Michael can speak, Kitsis could probably speak to this a little bit more, but there's a huge deficit coming, like upwards of 20, 30%. And there's already, there's a, a almost 30% reduction, about 26% reduction in the regular um, child abuse reports. And of the child abuse reports that are happening, they're more severe than normal. And so we're going from a summer of three months to going back to school with a summer of seven months, right? By the time it's all said and done. And so you add in all of the things that we've experienced and the emotion that we have and what kids are seeing at home on their TVs and on their Twitters and TikToks and everything else, we don't really know what's coming back to us and what kind of support they're gonna need. So all of this to say that we have a lot of things and a lot of burdens to plan for and I think that we are capable but I think we're gonna have to be innovative and really brave to recognize we don't know what's coming and there's a lot of pain out there that this is gonna make even worse. So with all of the deficits and everything else, I hope we keep talking about it. So thank you. Okay, I think we made the uh, entire rounds. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to uh, item number 16. And that is gonna be, uh, do we have any representatives from VTA or SEIU with us that would like to speak? Uh, if you do, you just can go ahead and unmute your speaker. Okay, hearing none, if there is one, we'll, we'll get to them a little bit later. We're gonna move on to item number 17, staff reports and presentations. First one, 17A is the budget update from uh, Ms. Kelly again, uh, gonna provide us a current report on the budget and information. Ms. Kelly. All right. Um, so yesterday, both leaders of the Senate and Assembly released a joint statement saying that the legislature will vote on the main budget bill on the 15th as planned. They are planning on adopting their version of the budget. Um, they have the same rules that we do as a government agency where they have to comply with the 42 hour in print rule to make their budget publicly available three days before. So we should be able to see it tomorrow. Um, however, the governor could exercise his authority and not have it printed tomorrow and keep negotiations going um, because he can waive that requirement during this time because we're under that emergency proclamation due to COVID-19. I don't think he will though. Um, they do say that the negotiations with the governor are productive and they're continuing and seem to be going well. Um, but I think what will get approved is the legislature's, legislature's version of the budget. And I think that will be done on the 15th. But however, um, as soon as they're eligible for floor action, things can change. Uh, so what this means is that the final uh, 2021 State Budget Act that the governor actually signs into law could look different from what we actually see approved on the 15th. And so some significant differences between the two parties right now, the governor and the legislature, are the budget revenue assumptions and whether or not to include additional federal funds in the adopted budget, as well as appropriate these, they have this language now where they're saying trigger on or trigger off reductions in order to balance the budget. So what the governor had proposed in May was that he wanted to make direct cuts now and then see if the federal funds come through and then trigger off those cuts. The legislature basically wants to do the opposite. They wanna fully fund us now and then trigger on additional cash deferrals um, in Prop 30, or I'm sorry, Prop 98, if the federal funds don't materialize by September 1st. And then they would go into effect on October to October 1st. Two very different approaches. Um, the governor's direct cuts allow districts to open a second layoff window in August for certificated staff and the legislature's version doesn't because we would be fully funded and we would receive the 2.31 COLA, which is the important part in order to avoid that layoff window because we have to receive at least 2% more than the previous year. Um, and then they also have two different approaches on Prop 98 reductions. Regardless if the state uh, receives the additional federal funding or not, the state still has to fund Prop 98. The legislature wants to increase the amount of cash deferrals and maximize the use of the state reserve uh, that we have now in one year. The governor wants to directly cut now, split the reserves up and the deferrals over the next two or three years, not all at once. So those are also two very different approaches. Uh, with the federal stimulus funding, 
Uh, there's lots of debates going back and forth on that additional $2.9 billion in federal CARES Act money, the coronavirus um, aid, relief, and economic security funding. And so um, that's supposed to help with learning loss mitigation. The governor is proposing to distribute funds only to school districts that qualify for those concentration grants. And the legislature wants to just allocate based on our LCFF allocations. We're hoping again for the legislature's version on this because we don't receive concentration dollars in back of bill because our unduplicated percentage is less than 55%. Uh, for 2021, we're going to be at 44.72%. So I don't know how close the two sides are on these very different approaches on these items, and that still will remain to be seen. Um, Governor Newsom, however, has very significant leverage in these final negotiations. Um, he has the power to veto the whole budget, send it back and say, try again, or he could approve the budget with line item reductions. And we don't know which line items he might reduce. And so that could drastically change the picture that we end up with on what actually gets adopted into law. Um, also last week, the Public Policy Institute of California released its latest statewide survey, which polled Californians about just the situation with COVID-19, but also included in some of those questions or surveys were related to the governor's state budget. And the survey was done in late May, just a few days after the governor had released his budget. And the respondents were asked if they opposed or favored the plan. And only 40% of those surveys said that they would support the proposed budget that the governor had laid out. 46% said they opposed it. And the remaining 14% just said, I don't know. They didn't have an opinion either way. So even though the surveys showed that they didn't agree with the governor's budget, he actually has the highest approval rating since he took office right now. So he has nearly a two thirds approval rating for the job that he's doing overall as governor. And this is 12 points higher from the last survey that was done in February. So he's, he's feeling this all time high right now. And so he also uh, was, they also surveyed on the COVID-19 situation. And even as a higher approval rating with that, they think that they, he's handled that really well. And he's at almost a 70% approval rating. So you never know what a governor is going to do when their approval rating is that high. Um, they might be willing to take risks that they might not normally. So that just remains to be seen. A few trailer bill languages were actually printed and passed in the last couple days. And one of those was the one regarding the deferrals. So we know for sure that our June 2020 funds will be deferred to July of 2020. And we could receive our, we will receive our June payment by July 15th. So we know for sure that that first deferral that the governor had proposed is happening. Mm -hmm. And then as far as our LCFF funds, um, just for Vacaville, you know, with the negative 7.92 COLA, over the next three years, we'll receive uh, $291 million in LCFF revenues. But that's drastically different from if the legislature gets the full funding and the COLA. Um, over the next three years, we would be funded at $332 million. So that's a difference of $41 million. So, I mean, they're just so far apart. So it really is going to be interesting to see what actually does get adopted. Of course, we're hoping the legislature's version will, um, because it's much nicer. Um, the other area that they're really far apart on is those categorical programs. The governor had said, you know, 10 to 50% reductions for some of those programs. Um, for us here, including ACES and uh, CTIG and adult education and a lot of those programs were hit pretty hard by the governor's choice. The legislature wants to fund them at the 1920 levels. So of course, we're hoping that that will happen as well. And then as far as special education goes, um, the governor is saying $645 per pupil. The legislature is proposing 625. Right now, our SELPA, um, the, which is the way we receive our funds for special ed, is funded at 557. So either way, it's a win for Vacaville. So that's good. And then um, the other thing too with the legislature's version of the budget is that cash will just become really important. Um, so we're going to uh, do daily checks on our cash for a while as things get really tight with those proposals that could come in April of 2021. Um, if those trigger on things come through with the legislature, we could see deferrals as early as January of 2021. Um, so January to June of next year will be really tricky. 
Um, so even though we would be fully funded, it's just monitoring the cash and making sure that we're staying on track with all of that will be really important. Um, another bill that's just upcoming, it hasn't been passed yet, but we're watching is AB 1835, which is the unspent supplemental funds. And so those are those supplemental funds that we receive through LCFF for our unduplicated students, which are our low socioeconomic, our English learners, our foster and our homeless youth. And so um, we're watching that one as well. And what that, what that came from or where that stemmed from was an audit that the state performed in November of 2019. They audited a whole three school districts, even though there's like a thousand school districts in California. They audited three and didn't get great results. And so because of that, this bill is proposed out there saying um, that we need to track our supplemental do dollars in a separate account, which we actually already do in Vacaville. Um, so whether it passes or not, we'll be okay there. Um, so we already track that separately in our general, um, our, our revenues that we have now. And so we'll see what happens there. Um, the difference would be for us that we wouldn't be able at the end of the year to then just apply that to our reserves at the end of the year. We'd actually have to keep that in those separate accounts um, as an ending fund balance to then reallocate for those supplemental purposes again in the following year. So we're, we'll watch that one. So that's the latest. Are there any questions? Anybody? I have a question. Go. Kelly, did you memorize all that? Are you? <laughs> I have some bullet points and some notes. Okay, okay. But yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate all the, the due diligence you're doing and putting all the effort you're putting into making sure you have all the information and staying up on top of the process. So uh, your, your job's really, really uh, important for us uh, right now. So uh, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Fantastic. Kelly, thank you for your presentations tonight, this one and the, the previous ones as well. We appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Uh, 17B has to be my favorite item of every single evening. Chief Facility Maintenance and Operations Officer Dan Banowitz. Give us an update on facilities. Mr. Banowitz. Yes. Good evening, board. President Jansen um, and Superintendent Shamia. Um, uh, Mr. President, if you have that uh, presentation that you can throw up there on the screen, please. I'm um, I'm gonna, I'm okay, I'm going to start off by talking about the, the Alamo fence. Um, it was brought up at a past meeting, um, and I've got some pictures to show you. This is going to be really quick, um, but I want to show you this. Um, the, the contract will be on the agenda on the next meeting um, to vote on. Um, so. Really quickly, what we're talking about is ornamental fencing, and this is kind of what it looks like. The, the fence is on the left and the, the gates on the right. Um, and we're, what we're doing is going across the front of the school um, to not allow people just to walk on the campus. And this would be a controlled gate. Um, that next one, you can see the red line there um, um, behind the trees. Um, and uh, so that red line is where the, the fencing will go across. And then it goes, the gates will be on each hallway um, to, for access. One of them will be electrified from the front office so they can open and close when people arrive. The other one will just be regular locked um, gates so they can, you know, it'll be open and closed during um, the start and the end of school. If you go to the next slide there, Mr. President, um, you can see it's, it, you know, it's not going to be very visible because it's behind those trees. Um, this view from Alamo there, or from Orchard um, Avenue, it's not going to be a very visible fence, but it is ornamental. It's not chain link, so it'll look a lot better um, and it's going to be presentable, but it will. Um, and this has been worked with uh, with Aaron and our facilities manager and Derek Wycliffe, the principal of the, of the school. Um, and we've been working on this to um, try and find a solution to um, control the access to the campus. Uh, unless there's any questions on that, I will move on. A couple, just uh, two clarification questions, Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that fence going to go in front of that first door? Is it going to go in front of all the doors to where no, you, no people from outside can get in through a door? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then um, number two, uh, I think Alamo is a beautiful campus. Um, did they give input on maybe, were they able to give input on this? Yeah, they, they were actually the ones who really came to us and asked for this. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, 
and because it's the front of the school and we're looking at looks, that's why, you know, the ornamental fencing is a little more expensive. It's not a big run, so it's not overly expensive, but ornamental fencing is more expensive than chain link fencing, but it's just, it looks a lot better and it doesn't look so institutional. Um, so that's why we're choosing to go this route. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Uh, everything else, um, Sierra Vista, the final increment of the Sierra Vista Measure A project has been completed. We've got a few little closeout items to do, little punch list things. Um, I think on my last update, I said there were the countertops where the last things we're waiting on, they have been, they have arrived and been installed. So we have little punch list items, but we're in the closeout phase of that project. Uh, the same goes with Zeno Stadium. Um, that project is completed and we're going through closeout now. Um, there's some things that we walked, uh, William um, Glover, their maintenance supervisor and I, we walked with um, Ron Thomas and uh, Mike Papadopoulos, uh, Coach Pop. We walked the site, some things that were not in the scope of the project that we're gonna be doing handling through maintenance, um, like painting the press boxes, uh, changing some windows in the press boxes. Uh, we've got some, some things to do to the visitors, uh, concession stand, for example. Just some things that were not in the scope of the project just to make the stadium look nicer. So when we do have that grand opening, it's gonna look tremendous. The field looks great, the track looks great, the new, um, the new areas where the new where the track events are. The, I mean, the whole project just came out great. The contractor, OC Jones and Sons, did a great job on it. Um, so we're really happy with it. Um, it looks really good. Um, Markham is moving right along. Um, the MP room is nearing completion. Um, we're gonna allow uh, Juan and uh, Child Nutrition to get into that kitchen around July 15th. So they'll have plenty of time to get that all ready to go. Um, the New classrooms, the next round of classrooms will be, um, they'll be completed um, between July 15th and July 25th, um, closer to the 15th, but we are ahead of schedule on those for, for the August opening as well. Um, we've already demolished all the buildings behind it. Um, we're working on the pads for the next round of classroom buildings and building Q. Um, so O and P are the ones we're working on now. Um, building Q is the kindergarten building um, we're working on that as well, but that's even two weeks ahead of schedule. So we're uh, moving along. They started demolishing, doing the demolition work inside the existing MP room. To con that's going to be converted into the admin building. Um, so we're moving ahead on that as well. Um, that'll be ready by August. Um, the old district office is no longer there. Um, it is gone. It's been demolished and hauled off, and it is no longer there. Um, so that's been done. Um, over uh, the last Friday and last Monday and Tuesday, um, Aaron completed the moves with Buckingham and Country High. Um, so Buckingham was taken out of the Bella Vista Road buildings um, and Country High was taken out of uh, the, uh, the McClellan Street area. Um, and as, as, as I was driving in to check, um, I didn't want to spend too much time because those things are painful. Um, but every time, every morning I checked, I, you know, he's moving things out as contractors. He's moving contents out and contractors are bringing out carpet and baseboard and everything. So we have people going at the same time. Um, we're doing very well construction wise, but it's a five week project. So they are, um, they're moving nonstop and they're even working Saturdays because they know the schedule is tight. Um, but we are, um, we're moving along on that fun one. Um, Bella Vista Road construction, like I said, is moving right along. Um, we are now moving into other projects um, in Measure A. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is the next phase of the Wilsey Wood Theater project. Um, and that is, we, you know, we're replacing the 20 ton um, air conditioning unit on the roof. So that's why we can't have the meeting there. Sorry about that. But um, that unit was, um, was pretty bad. So we have been working on replacing that one. Um, and the next thing is gonna be the sound system um, for the theater. Um, and we're doing some research and working with the staff there to um, figure out what the scope of that is and what that is. Um, and there'll be more um, at the special board workshop. If we have time, I'll have some, I've got some ideas uh, for Wilsey Wood that I want to um, pass through the board um, if we get to it. Um, if not, we'll do it the next time. We're also working with our architects for the new Vacaville High School, the second gym. Um, and we actually drove out to Sacramento this afternoon and walk through a gym building that um, our architects that we use out there designed um, about five years ago. And it's a, it's a, a secondary gym, um, and it is, uh, but it's, it's made a little bit different. It's a metal building um, for the most part, um, and it, it's, um, it's pretty darn impressive. So 
Um, I was pretty impressed with it. Um, so I'm going to uh, schedule a, a time when we can take out um, some Vacaville High School, you know, Coach Pop and, and Adam White and, and any of the other committee members that want to join us, we'll go out there and they can see this, um, how nice this building is. Because it's kind of what we're thinking about, we would like to design um, for that uh, second building. And then um, on the maintenance side, our maintenance crews, they have been back um, and they, they've been back, they came back in May and they've been just tackling project after project. Um, you know, one example is at Fairmont, the uh, upstairs, the computer lab, um, they have put a wall up and separated it to, to make it two rooms now instead of one big lab. Um, so have more flexibility for Greg and his programs. Um, we have the um, old kindergarten building that where Child Start was in. Um, they're taking down walls and repairing carpet there. We have uh, the portable at McClellan Street that, um, that we have for, uh, that was the youth services office that needs to be a classroom. So they have to take down the walls. They've been really out there getting it done um, from the start. As soon as they came back, they wanted to come back, um, and they've been working really well um, and getting that. And we have a long list of items to go. So any questions? I just have one quickie. Did the old gym get a new speaker system? Not sound system, but new speakers. Not yet. That's a future. Ah. Uh, future. We have a, another project at Vacaville High School. It's a modernization project. Um, that's not, you know, so we're, we're not there yet. We're, we're concentrating on that gym because we know once we get going and basketball starts up and everything else, they need that gym. Um, so we're, we're kind of focusing on that right now. Thanks for we'll that, Tracy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not going to let you forget. <laughs> I won't forget. Dan, do you, do you have anything at all on, on that you want to say, uh, Bethany? We're not sure. Um, absolutely. Uh, I, we have um, officially entered escrow. Um, that, that, that happened on Monday morning when uh, Placer Title received our deposit check and, um, and that paperwork. So we are in escrow. I've had multiple meetings with uh, the, the Bethany uh, uh, representatives. And, um, you know, we're trying to turn around these offices that we're going to be uh, in really quick. And as we're going through escrow, they have been very nice to work with us. Um, they're going to allow us to get in there um, on July 15th to replace the carpet, paint the walls, and get those offices ready for the nursing and for um, all the other people that are going to be um, going into those offices. So then we can turn around and create those classrooms back at Payton again. Um, the nurse's office, for example, has walls up and everything. We're going to have to take those down and, and replace the carpet there. So um, we have, we have, ordered the carpet. We've got the paint on order. Um, we're just waiting for them. Um, they're clearing it out, for, you know, and uh, by July 15th, we'll get in there and we'll be able to turn that thing around as we're going through the process of escrow. So it's likely that by the time school starts, we will have two, two available classrooms at Payton, which, which is pretty good, you know? It's a good move. That, and, and we should have three, um, I believe, and Sasha can tell me I'm wrong, um, but because I think one of them is moving to the um, where the child start was at Fairmont. So we should um, be able to convert those as well. That's right. That's great. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Dan, two things. Yes. Um, first thing, I got scared when you said you electrified the fence at <laughs> Alamo. That was the first thing. I went, wow, okay. Pretty, I thought those kids were pretty cool kids and the staff was good. But Yeah, they're, they're not bad. They're all right. And the second thing, you got booted out to the garage, huh? Yes, I'm coming to you from the garage of Chateau Banowitz. It's, a cl it's the, uh, <laughs> the quietest place in the house tonight, so that's where I'm at. It looks very neat. You got a nice, yeah. neat garage. <laughs> I, spend, I spend a lot of time out here. The, the only thing I noticed was uh, all your containers, or most of them, are Dodger Blue. So, um, yeah. You probably Mostly have... everything I own is, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for your report. I greatly appreciate it. Thank hey, with, you. with that, we're going to uh, item 18, which are so our action items. The first one is 18A. Um, it's pursuant to Ed Code um, 5000, a regular biannual election for members of the Vacaville Unified School District will be conducted on November 3rd, 2020, 
for the purpose of electing persons to fill the offices of members of the governing board whose terms expire December 11th, 2020. Uh, I'll make a motion. Um, moved by Mr. Kitsis, second. I'll second. Um, by Mrs. Daly and roll call vote. And Shelly. Yes. Tracy. Yes. Michael. Yes, sir. Sean. Yes. Mike. Yes. And myself is a yes as well. Uh, track. Item 18B requested that the board approve resolution number 35 regarding the education protection account, which we had a um, presentation earlier. Do I have a motion? I'll, I'll make that it. one. Okay. Uh, like moved by Wyndham, second by uh, Ms. Tracy. Roll call vote. Um, Shelley. Yes. Tracy. Yes. Michael. Yes. Sean. Yes. Mike. Yes. And myself is a yes as well. Uh, the next on the list is the uh, budget for Buckingham. It's requested that the board approve Buckingham's 2020-2021 budget as presented. Motion? Motion. Second. Second. Okay. Motion by Silva, second by Wyndham. Uh, roll call vote, Shelley? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Sean? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a yes as well. Um, 18D is the budget for Fairmont uh, as presented this evening. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Motion by Silva. Second. Second by Mr. Kitsis. Roll call vote. Uh, Shelley? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Sean? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a yes as well. Now, uh, 18A, it's requested that the board approve the operations written report for Buckingham Collegiate Charter Academy for the 2020-2021 school year. And let's see. Mr. Santa Padre, were you going to present on this or? Very briefly. Fantastic. Um, Good evening, President Jansen, board members, and Superintendent Shamia. Um, as we had mentioned at the previous meeting, this, these operation written reports for our charters and our district are in place of this year's LCAP, which usually would be coming to the board before July 1st. So these are the reports that are showing what we did during the COVID-19 crisis over the last few months and how things changed for us. Um, and then we'll have the uh, next year's LCAP in December and then we'll get back onto our, our three-year cycle. So tonight is really um, a, a very brief report. In fact, in the instructions, they said in each section, no more than 300 words. So we appreciated that. And I will have uh, Ms. Eads, who's the principal at Buckingham, just give you a very brief overview of what's in the report and we'll be, we'll be done. Hi there, thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, President Jansen. Thank you, Dr. Chimie and board members. Um, it's a very, uh, very interesting report. As I say, they want you short answers. Um, so we appreciated that, like Ed said. Um, the first question is asked you, how are you addressing um, the distance learning in and of itself? Um, so we did offer both offline uh, paper options and the digital format. Um, for our population, the digital format was by far the most popular. We only had two families picking the, the paper option. Um, uh, we had most mostly using Google Classroom as our platform, but also Khan Academy um, was very popular uh, ways for video learning. Um, and then we do have students who were already in a hybrid model where they took their classes online prior to that via Edgenuity. So those continued as normal. Those students really didn't notice too much difference at all. Um, and just like everybody who has talked about distance learning, we uh, we did a great job. We have fabulous teachers. We have wonderful students and families who are very resilient. But it was it's it's distance learning is tough. Um, so we did it, we struggled with that. Um, in terms of our English learners, foster youth, low income, again providing everything that we can in bilingual materials um, and then uh, the big push district-wide was to make sure our low-income students had um, all the materials they needed for a distance learning so whether that is the Chromebooks that we that we handed out or or the paper option so we did that um, 
through, through what type of options they asked, kind of what learning options we did do. So like I said, we talked about Google Classroom, Khan Academy, Edpuzzle is a really popular one. And I, and I noticed a lot of teachers in different schools have started to adopt Edpuzzle. That's kind of a video platform where the teachers can post their videos and then have questions, students can answer questions. It's very much more interactive. That's a fun one. Um, and then again, they were able to access that using the Chromebooks that we provided. Uh, the meal service was just like the rest of the district. We were so, so grateful that meal service has con did continue during this period, is going to continue um, for our students because that's so very important. Um, and then the last but not least was, you know, uh, for, for our students, how are we keeping track of them? And um, being a small school, we had the advantage of we know a lot of our students really, really well. And, and a lot of students, you know, text their teachers on their phone so they know what's going on with them. So if the teachers weren't able to get a hold of um, their students, they weren't getting anything from them then admin one and if we if we didn't have any way to get in contact with them we, we did refer that maybe one or two to the district but overall um, most most were responsive and it, not to say that distance learning was great it was certainly tough we're glad to be at least done with it for this year um, but yep yeah, that's the report fantastic thank you Allie uh, any questions from the board members I have a quick question um, My, Allie, for how, how many classes do the flip the classroom model where they uh, watch a recorded lecture at home and then come in uh, to do like uh, normally would come in to do whatever problem sets or whatnot. All of was our math something? classes. All math. Okay, math. Okay. All math. Yeah. And was that still we'll effective? Have... Sorry. Uh, it seems to be the last couple of years that uh, that they've been doing it. It seems really effective. Some of them were trying to start to adopt that. I know world history and in U.S. history, some of the teachers were experimenting with that flipped model in distance learning, and um, we'll see if it continues once we're back in school as normal. Yeah, I really like the, the concept behind it, um, and I was curious to see, uh, maybe later on, um, but, uh, you know, not tonight, but uh, I was curious to see how that, how that was, um, how that still was successful uh, mm -hmm. during this, the distant learning component, so. Yeah, we just got the grades, and so I'll be doing a deep dive sort of grade analysis in the next couple of days, so I'll be able to report that, at least that element of it, and then you're welcome to come in and talk to our math teachers anytime you want. Once we get right. back to school. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Fantastic. Anybody else? Allie, per uh, perfect. Thank you for the presentation. Um, with that, it's requested that the board approve the operations written report for Buckingham Collegiate Charter Academy for the 2021 school year. Do I have a motion? I'll move it. Moved by Ms. Tracy. Second. Second. By uh, Ms. Shelley. Uh, roll call vote. Shelley? Yes. Tracy? Yep. Michael? Yes. Sean? Yes. Mike? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Uh, Ed, looks like you're up for 18F for uh, Fairmont Charter School. And I will pass this immediately over <laughs> to Moffitt, and he will do the, the similar, similar task. Fantastic. Hey. Thank you so much, Mr. Santa Padre and uh, President Jansen and uh, Superintendent Shamia and members of the board. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk about a very short required document for the state of California. Um, I was able to talk a little bit um, about a month ago about what we were doing at Fairmont, but this just formalize it, formalizes it into three pages for the state of California. So uh, the first section is really about um, what program changes happened in uh, response to school closures. And really uh, the staff at Fairmont worked incredibly hard and worked incredibly hard together. Um, this highlights the fact that our grade level teams um, really took a grade level wide approach um, to how we did distance learning. Um, they designed packets together. They designed online Google Classrooms together. They divided up the work sometimes and, and really worked as a grade level ensuring equity for all of our students in each classroom across the grade, but also um, to ensure that um, teachers felt supported and help throughout this process. It was um, a hard task to move to distance learning um, almost overnight. And so working as grade levels uh, really helped. Um, the second uh, question asks us to talk about our support for English learners, foster youth, and low-income students. We have 81 English learners at Fairmont, and we are lucky to have a wonderful English language development teacher. Um, and we utilized our reading teachers as well at Fairmont to make sure that we checked in with those 81 English learners um, 
throughout the week. Um, we provided support for them to access the work that their grade level classroom teachers were assigning, uh, but we also provided um, special Zoom sessions and phone conversations to help those students um, talk and communicate, um, to use English in conversation, um, to also process what was going on in the world around them. The big focus um, for ELD was really on uh, understanding current events and, and what was happening with school closure and COVID-19. For our low income students, um, we utilized our counselor and our school psychologist and our data and content specialist. Um, they reached out to each and every um, student um, that needed support. We had 25 families before the school closure that were taking advantage of a weekend meal, meal program. Um, as we reached out to more families, that, um, that number increased to about 50. So our counselor was delivering weekly um, meals for the weekend to, to those families um, and checking in on them and providing one-on-one -on -one sessions and group sessions uh, for those students. Um, it was pretty incredible and heartening to see. Um, the third question asks us to talk about um, high quality distance learning opportunities for our students. And we were really lucky um, that before school closed, we were utilizing a lot of online and digital platforms. Those carried seamlessly over um, into our distance learning once we could get Chromebooks into the hands of families that needed them and, and training families on how to log in and use them. So I wanna give another thank you to the technology department in the Vacaville Unified School District who answered phone calls and questions and emails and, and really partnered um, with us to, to make that happen. Um, so a lot of those programs were available before school closed and they're gonna continue on throughout the summer seamlessly um, and, and it, it was pretty wonderful to see. Um, question four asks us to talk about um, the school meals um, that were provided to students. We encouraged our families to take advantage of um, what Vacaville Unified was serving at the four meal locations. And I, I really do wanna give a shout out to uh, Juan Cordon and the child nutrition staff um, and talking with principals up and down the state and across the country during this crisis, there were many, many districts that were just unable to serve meals to their students and their families. And it was not the case in Vacaville. From the day schools closed, um, we were meeting the nutritional needs of students, breakfast and lunch. We were making it happen. And um, I will forever be grateful to the new Child Nutrition Program for making that happen for our families. Um, finally, the last section um, asked to talk about student supervision. And this is one where uh, we really utilized every single um, technology tool um, at our disposal, from Google Forms um, to allow families to let us know how they were doing, to creating a Google Voice text uh, number for our school where people could text us questions, um, utilizing our school-wide email address, um, but also just picking up the phone and calling families. Um, there are seven families that we um, were unable to reach, but um, the other 603 we were able to make contact with. Um, and, and that fluctuated as families had different needs and um, different things come up throughout the school closure. Um, but um, once again, reaching out and meeting families where they are and trying to understand uh, their unique circumstances was something that we set as a priority. So that covers the three pages that the state requires of us. Um, if there are no further questions, I'll hand it back to Mr. Santa Padre. I have one question. Yes. Can, is there a, a platform for you to take all those cool things that you use, like since you had this edge on really understanding how to leverage technology, where you could use that Google Voice text line for your school and, and where you can put it in a district-wide best practice or tips and tricks or like the cheat sheet. So since you're brilliant, I can go and copy you and look good too, kind of a thing. Like, does that exist? <laughs> I think what was really exciting throughout um, this whole pandemic and this crisis is that the elementary principals and the principals and administrators throughout the district really had to lean in on each other and support each other. And so um, the number of Zoom meetings that we had together just as administrators, where we were sharing ideas and resources. Um, before schools closed, we were, we were sharing our weekly newsletters um, that we send out to families with each other and um, copying and pasting and stealing ideas and borrowing them. Um, and so we've been sharing these things as well, but um, we meet on Monday as an educational elementary leadership team and um, we should probably just do a brain dump where we put this all down in one spot and uh, in hopes that we never have to use it again. Awesome. I want Thank you. to add to that real quick, the technology coordinators did a lot of that 
Um, didn't Don Marsh set up some kind of sharing format as well? I mean, they really, having the, the technology department, such a strong department um, in the tech support and in the teaching part really brought, it, brought us through all of this. So they did create some kind of sharing mechanism. I just remember seeing that. Isn't, didn't Don create something, Greg? There are grade level um, Google share sites where teachers were able to share their best practices and um, principals were able to add their ideas as well. So these are all being archived and, and stored. And, um, and as we look at what reopening will look like, we'll definitely utilize a lot of, of these plans um, in case we ever have to close schools like this again. Fantastic. Anybody, anybody, oh, go I'm sorry, Ed, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and we'll be ready if, if smoke closes schools or fire closes <laughs> school or wind closes school or zombies close school, so we'll be ready. Yeah, we are actually reminiscing today on how overwhelmed we got by a couple of smoke days, and now it's like, that's <laughs> not <laughs> Perfect. Any, anybody else from the board? Okay. Mr. Moffitt, did you leave money in your budget for new hats? <laughs> Thank you for that question, uh, Trustee Silva. Um, we, we, um, we have talked um, about uh, wearing uh, COVID-19 hats with pool noodles to keep us six feet apart um, on them. But, uh, but that'll come out of my own personal uh, budget for that. That's fantastic. I'll move to approve this. Okay. Second. <laughs> uh, moved by Ms. Tracy, second by Sean. Uh, roll call vote, Shelley? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Sean? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself? And Greg and uh, Ed, uh, both thank you for your presentation on that as well. Um, last item on the action items, 18G, approval of the classified month, uh, management 12th month salary schedule revision. Uh, requested that the board approve the revised schedule effective June 12th, 2020 as presented. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Um, by Mr. Kitsis, second by Mr. Silva, any questions? I wanted Chris to kind of just go over this real quick, why we're bringing the classified management. Fantastic, so. per perfect time. Mr. Chris. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Shimio, uh, Board President Jansen. Um, we are bringing back, yes, we're back with the classified management salary schedule. Um, this is a really simple one. A couple of years ago, we moved the directors to a positive work calendar, which effectively changed the number of work days they had. Um, but we didn't reflect it on the schedule and uh, all work days need to be listed on the schedule. So that's all we're doing tonight. We're just adding the work days to the directors um, on the salary schedule. That's it's as simple as that. Fantastic. Any questions to that? Seeing none, we'll go right down the roll call. Thank you, Chris. Um, Shelley. Yes. Tracy. Yes. Michael. Yes. Sean. Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a yes as well. Item number 19A, uh, the consent calendar. These are routine items on the consent calendar are enacted by the board in one motion. Discussion only occurs if members on the board, administration, or public request specific items to be discussed and or removed. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll make it. Can I ask a quick question? Not yet. Okay. I'll second uh, him to ask that question. There, well, can I finish? Motion by Wyndham, second by Miss Stacy. All yours, go ahead and ask your question. I don't get the 19B. I feel like I didn't connect the dot. Why, why is it there? The random minutes approval in consent? Am I just not understanding what I'm reading? 19B. Yes, 19B1, approval of the board minutes. That's, I believe, how we normally approve the previous. Well, and I just, okay, it just looks different to me. Okay, cool. Never mind. Okay. Any other questions on the consent? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, Shelley? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Michael? Yes. John? Yes. Mike? Yes. And mine's a yes as well. Uh, number 20, we have a uh, informational items. 
Consideration of primary instructional material for physics and engineering. Um, this can be reviewed at uh, 100 McClellan Street. It's gonna be used at the uh, Buckingham Collegiate Charter Academy, fantastic. Um, and if you would like to see it, if you could please call and make an appointment and we'll have somebody there to be able to show it for you. Future business, item 21, we have our special board meeting on the 20th uh, at nine o'clock and then our regular next meeting on the 25th of June at 6.30. Um, with that, we have nothing to go back to closed session. I'd like to thank everybody that was here for the meeting. I think it was extremely productive and good night. Good night. Everybody, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. <laughs>